you were well into adulthood in the 60s. You were teaching in universities. You were at Kent State, I know, for a while. You Did you go to Woodstock or you didn't? You, I remember there was oh, yes. some story about yes. Woodstock. Yes. You took one of your, your kids to Woodstock, right? Oh, I took both of them and both my wife to Woodstock. Oh, okay, right. right. Mm -hmm. So you, you lived through that moment, and you were very conscious of it. I was alive, but, you know, 8 or 10 or whatever. Um, th this time feels to me like, like whatever the wave was that was washing into American culture at the time and then crested and then washed back out in Hunter Thompson's famous rendition of the the period it feels like that wave has come back now mm -hmm. like you know the interest in in psychedelics uh alternative energy um sort of intense interest in in women's rights and and lgbt rights and um the sort of conscious uh attention being paid to forms of oppression and um it feels to me like sort of a second surge of that energy. Mm -hmm. Does it feel that way to you, or is that just oh, yes. my framing of it? Yes, at this conference, the Institute of Nordic Sciences conference I'm at, uh, there are a lot of young, enthusiastic people who see that uh, this is their chance to organize, work for the environment, work for um, harmony among people, work for peace on the planet, very, very idealistic. But I think the difference is that this group is much more practical. And is that because we have this historical precedent of the 60s and we can see the mistakes that were made, things that were pushed too far, things that were unrealistic? For example, I was just in North Carolina um, at a, a community there of just beautiful, wonderful people who are... Um, trying to create a village and they've got a couple of guys from Africa who grew up in villages and they, they're village consultants they're sort of like helping them uh, plant the seeds of village life how to take care of each other how to share resources and all these things and they, they jokingly refer to it as an unintentional community <laughs> um, and you know I'm looking at the way they do it they own the land independently each one owns their own house um, but they share some things, uh, you know, sort of how children are raised and uh, what kind of sexual um, interactions are, are cool or not cool. And, all this. and I, I just sort of, it, it struck me as people trying to do the same things that a lot of people were doing in the 60s with so-called communes, but much more cautious because they've seen what has happened in communes, right? Where one ego gets out of control and it becomes a guru situation or whatever. Anyway, my, my point is just that it feels like this movement is, maybe it's a stronger wave. You know what I mean? Maybe yeah. the, the 60s wave was kind of top heavy because it was the first time it, there was a lot of excitement. We're going to change the world. Everything, the Earth Day is going to save the planet. And now we're trying to do it again, but informed by just how hard it really is. Well, I think that you see it very clearly. I was living through the 60s. I actually wrote some papers on communes because I visited many of the communes. Mm. And... I could see very clearly how fragile the, com the communes were because they depended too much on the vision of one person. Mm. There was not the ground rules that were enforced, and they were not sustainable. The ones that were sustainable, some of them still exist in one form or another. But by sustainable, I mean you know growing your own crops, having people right. getting jobs in the larger community. Uh, coming together and sharing resources and also having, shall we say, rules of behavior that prevent um, romantic entanglements and sexual encounters from getting out of hand. Right. I think that the group that you've just been talking about learned from those mistakes and they have a better chance of being in there for the long haul. Yeah. And little groups like that starting at the uh, bottom can have major repercussions on the top. I want to recommend to your listeners Stephen Schwartz's book, 
the eight laws of change. Mm -hmm. And he demonstrates how very small groups of people can make major changes in their community and in the world at large. And that when you look at the changes that have been made over the last century, the beneficial changes, almost all of them have been nonviolent. Mm. They have not been due to war, they have not been to dictators, they have been groups of people, sometimes very small groups of people, cooperating and making a major change. The abolition of slavery for one. Mm -hmm. That was not a mass movement. That was due to very small groups of people that fought very, very hard and eventually were able to topple slavery. And of course it led to the Civil War and the unfortunate aftermath of the Civil War set things back and had to wait until the uh, 20th century to get things back in balance again. But the seesaw effect is something that you run into a lot when you go into politics. And again, remember that, uh, as the old saying goes, all politics is local. The politics start at the bottom, and then if you've got something good going for you, they're going to disseminate and they're going to reach the top.